step into the latest installment of our rebroadcast series, podcast number 61, titled, This Video Offers Valuable Insights to Ponder, featuring Mike from COT on the End Generation Project. Originally aired on April 2, 2024, exclusively on counciloftime.com, this episode delves into Bible study and daily excellence with the realm of daily excellence with esteemed speakers. Dive deep into discussions ranging from biblical eschatology to overcoming addiction and alcoholism. Hosted by Michael from Council of Time, join us as we uncover the freshest global perspectives in today's riveting episode. Experience daily insights from Michael from Council of Time, a renowned Christian figure known for his expertise in end-time prophecies and readiness. For further enlightenment, visit the Council of Time website linked in description. We're dedicated to providing truth, hope, and support to those struggling with addiction and seeking God's guidance. Your support drives our mission to guide individuals toward truth, sobriety, and preparedness for the challenges ahead. Join our exclusive Locals community for EGP family members and stay tuned for updates. Thank you for being a vital part of the success of the End Generation Project. Before delving into today's rebroadcast podcast, this video offers valuable insights to ponder episode 61. Let's celebrate the remarkable growth of our channel, reflecting the hunger among believers in these end generation times. It's truly a blessing to see our content reaching audiences worldwide, with translations available in over 12 languages. As we journey together, we're committed to keeping this podcast ad-free, thanks to your subscriptions. Join our vibrant communities on Locals and Kofi for prayer requests and shout-outs. All right, now let's dive into today's podcast. This video offers valuable insights to ponder. Tune in to the rebroadcast of In Generation Projects podcast, number 61 with Mike from COT. Blessings to all. They did it again. Again, again, again. They did it again. Okay, as soon as I turn the system on, here at... uh, 7 p.m., they did it again. They reset everything. God bless each and every one of you. Listen, I'm hoping the sound is sufficient today. I know there's somewhat of an echo. I'm hunting for it, and I can't find it. There should be a tiny echo. Not not a big deal. A tiny one. Today, we're going to recap the seals. It's going to require you guys to interact with me. I will most certainly need your input. We're going to take a look at a few things today. A summary of the seals. Something that is a, it is a controversial subject to a lot of people, not to me. Because a lot of people don't yet believe the seals are happening. Uh, anybody who's been here for a while you, I make a statement often, which is that I have to go with what the Lord has given me. I'm not here to convince anybody. I'm not. I don't want you guys to be convinced to believe anything my way, right? I'm just talking to you guys about the seals and a strong belief I have behind them. Could my belief be absolutely wrong? Of course it can. Of course it can. Um, I'm not, you know, We are human beings, right? Our Father has that truth. Do I believe that the Lord has placed upon me an urgency with the seals? Yes. Do I believe they're open? Yes. I will discuss how. See, it is, I believe it's disingenuous. If the Lord gave you an understanding of something in the Word of God, but you disregarded the understanding that the Lord had given you, and you went with somebody else's understanding. That is disingenuous. I say that because it's the only way I know how to be genuine, is to be straightforward with what the Lord gave me. And most often, these views, they do not create friendships. They don't, right? They don't. They cause... uh, or ruckus at best. But I have to go with him, right? Especially since when I was young, uh, I had an understanding of revelation before I could read or do anything else. It's almost as if I could see what was happening, right? 
Um, maybe some of you are like that when you when you were young, you had an understanding of the Word of God, right? Not a complete understanding, but just the Lord had given you certain things that you can't deny. And because you had them before, you were introduced to everybody else in world events. You know they came from Him. In my case, every time somebody uh, uttered something about the seals or read something about the seals, I could only see one thing. And that was the immediate, uh, the immediacy of these seals. So as we cover these, keep that in mind, all right? Because the Lord may have given you something complimentary or totally different. Whatever he gave you, always go with what the Lord has given you to be genuine. Now, we often don't know how things fit together, right? But if all of us are genuine, we're going to find that he gave us the truth. That's what we'll find. In my opinion, man is not right about God's word, right? They're not. God is right about his own word. This is his word, right? He gives us uh, maybe a piece here, maybe a piece there, but God is right about his own word. So I think it's, uh, I don't think it's uh, very wise for a person to attempt to try and be, you know, the right person in the room all the time. And they get angry because nobody else believes you know, the way that person believes. I don't believe in those ways. You may have a, a, a total different belief. So be it. So be it. Um, that's a good thing, in my opinion. Because if you are genuine with what God gave you, if I'm genuine with what God gave me, we're going to come to a surprising truth, right? All too often in prophecy, you cannot see how those parts interact. You can't see it, but it does require honesty, even in the face of stupidity. It requires honesty. And so that's all I can give you here. That's all I can give you here. So anyway, we're going to be reading out of Revelation 6 and a few other places in the Word of God. And of course, uh, we can't leave, you know, Matthew 24 alone. It, it is amazing to me what the Lord has actually given us. It is quite amazing to me. I'm not here to, you know, bring any new scoops to you guys. Well, except for one. Uh, something else has been plaguing me lately. But I'll tell you guys about that halfway through our conversation. Uh, something I keep, I'm, I'm given something that's quite disturbing. And uh, I'll share that with you guys as I go forward. Tonight. It'll be tonight so that you guys are prepared if uh, we have to start going through certain uh, instances of destruction, then you'll know, you know, you'll, you can take comfort knowing that your father's doing this. And by the way, before I start reading anything, how many of you are frightened, honestly frightened of the seals? Don't be afraid if you are, right? Don't be afraid if you're frightened. If they frighten you, if these things frighten you, don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid of that. One of the, one of the reasons why we, we discuss prophecy is that we understand our Father's declarations better right, than, than before so that we can have a, take comfort in God's truth. Prophecy is part of God's truth. And that it is. And so if we are familiar with God's truth, right, we're not going to be uh, taken by it. First thing you need to know Jesus is the only one that's worthy to open the seals. He's the only one. Now, have an understanding about that. Christ Jesus is the only one. Jesus of Nazareth is the only one worthy to open the seals. Who is responsible for our souls here on this earth? Who's responsible? Christ is. Remember he said, all who have come to me, the Father hath given me. Remember that? He's responsible for us. He's raising us, right? He is making his abode with us when we keep his commandments. So one of the keys is this. If you're frightened of God's prophecies, seek to be obedient from your heart. Don't comply to escape anything. Don't do that. That is, even our Savior said that's not good advice. Don't comply to escape. 
And that is man's embedded way in the flesh to do something to get something else. With the Lord, don't make things a formula. Don't do that. Make sure they're genuine, please. Make sure they're genuine. Always genuine. Because the Lord is quite genuine with us. And he wants all of us by, he wants that to be our choice, right? Our choice. Um, to choose him or not. So I'm going to read something here. I'm going to read something. I'm gonna, we, we have to establish something here. Before we go into Revelation, let's go into John 14. Let's go into John 14. Okay? If you guys would, please. John 14, 10. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? In the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. He's not speaking of himself. He said, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Jesus is saying this. He doeth the works. He said, do you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? Jesus continues, and he says, the words I speak to you, I didn't create these words. But the Father that dwells in me, these are his words. They're not my words. He's saying the words I'm communicating, the words I speak to you, what I speak about, I'm not the author of those words. I like that. I like that. It gives me that. Goosebumps, it does. Which means Jesus was a vessel who spoke what thus saith the Lord. He did not speak of his own accord. He spoke what the Father spoke. Do you know what that means? That means the entire time Jesus was on the earth, people heard God speaking. That's what it means. My Lord, can you imagine? That means when they discussed anything with Jesus, they were actually talking to the living God. Jesus is saying the words he speaks. He did not speak on his own behalf. He didn't speak them out of himself. He spoke the words the Father gave him. Now think of the connection between you and the words you speak. When you speak, people know you by the words you speak. You know me by the words I speak. If you hear my words, you can say, well, Mike doesn't like this, or why not? Well, because he said. Well, Mike is this, or why? Because Mike said. See, it's the same thing. So when people heard Christ, they heard God Almighty. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? So no wonder, no wonder in the Gospel of John, <clears throat> when it begins, it says it's talking about the Word of God, and it's talking about that Jesus is the Word that was made flesh and dwelt among men. He did not speak on his own behalf. He did not speak of himself. He spoke everything the Father spoke. So people were having conversations with the living God. That is, that is amazing. And to, and to hear the words of the Creator, the Creator of all things, to hear the words of the Creator, and to hear the sentiment of the Creator, and to know how loving and forgiving He was, my, that changes everything. That changes everything. Come on, folks, stay with me here. Because this, you know what, if, if, if we could all get this, that's a, that's a breaking. You know, because in the mind, for some reason, we separate the living God from Christ. We do. Not knowing, right, something as small as this really gives us one of the greatest insights into what actually happened when Christ was here. People were speaking to the living God, and they did not know it. They didn't know it. Now, Jesus was kind, wasn't he? Yes, he was kind. Jesus was very forgiving, wasn't he? Yes. Where the law said to stone a woman, Jesus said, no, I'll forgive her. Are you kidding? And that was the Father, that was the Creator. He was saying those things. That was the Creator of everything, speaking to mankind directly. And he was not mean, was he? He was not out to get anybody, was he? Hmm? He wasn't. He was forgiving. He was about giving multiple chances to the one who kept falling and failing, wasn't he? My goodness. Knowing that changes 
the New Testament. It changes the entirety of the New Testament. When a person stops disconnecting the Creator from the words Jesus spoke, from those things Jesus did, when they finally see that the works of Christ were God's works, that the words of Christ were God's words, it changes everything. Everything. He says, Believe me, this is uh, John fourteen eleven. Believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. Now I want you to uh, uh, try and get this. He said, believe me that I'm in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. If you can't believe what I'm telling you right now, look at my track record, he's saying. Look at the track record and believe me for the works sake, for the good works that I have done. For the good works. He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the one that believes me. Now, he just spoke about, he just spoke about him being in the Father and the Father in him. In other words, he's telling people, I and the Father are one. He's telling people, I and the Father are one. Just like you are the word you speak, and the word you speak is you. Jesus is saying, I and the Father are one. And those who believe this, those who believe this word, those who believe that word, the works that I do, shall I do also. Listen, when, when you really get it, what Jesus is saying in simple language, when you get it, because it's only man's doctrine that will go into your mind and start telling you to stop believing it the Lord's way and believe it man's way. It is man's doctrine who complicated this simplistic issue. God never complicated his word. <clears throat> he didn't do that. Mankind did. People have embellished his word. They lost the simplicity of it, the truth of it. Let's continue. Listen. He says, I say unto you, he that believeth on me. Now, wait a minute. Why, why do we have the differences in believing in me, believing on me, believe on my name, right? What is that supposed to be? Why, why the difference in vocabulary here? Those that believe on me on me that word on right is the same as in but listen to me this word is much more than that to believe in someone this way is a continuance of belief in someone now what that means is you're not just believing the instance of that person but you believe with a continuation in that person listen, follow me carefully Right? Yes, is that word. When you believe on someone, you're not just believing what they said five minutes ago. But you're waiting to hear whatever they speak in the future, and you'll believe that also. It's a continual belief. Not just in what they spoke, but in what they stand for. Herein we have a problem. See, because a lot of people believe certain parts of the gospel. They do not believe all of it. And why do I say this? See, we need to clean this up because why in the world should a Christian be powerless? If any one of us were to ever say, well, you know, I'm not powerless concerning the power of the Holy Spirit, another person would say, well, I'd have to see it to believe it because nothing has worked for me. Somebody else may say the same thing. We're not supposed to be saying that. You're not supposed to be saying that. You're not. You're the ones that are supposed to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. Not get hyped up with a bunch of words. Forget the words. No. What about the end result? The words mean nothing if there's no change. They mean 
absolutely nothing if there's no change. Jesus said that himself. What good is a word that does nothing to have change in your life? And when the Lord said, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. You, you know why people can't believe that? Huh? But now let's go ahead and face it. This is an honesty moment. This is an absolute honesty moment. Now you have people sitting around powerless. And they'll try to conform to some type of belief saying, I believe it, but in the truth they don't. Because if they did, they would exercise what the Lord is exercising. Here's a fact. Let's go ahead and face it. The honesty moment. We do not believe that. Let's go ahead and swallow that. We don't believe that. And why don't we believe that? Because we've not been able to muster that same authority, that same dominion, that same voice of authority, declaration, that calls results. And so, because we don't believe it, guess what we've done? We've altered the word of God to suit our unbelief. Mm -hmm. We sit there and say, well, you know, it's how we think. This is how we think. Now, say we. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lump everybody into it. We, I'm saying we because, in general, it's with many Christians, if not most Christians, because they don't believe they can do anything like that. They make an instant separation between themselves, what the word is, the power in that word, and so they start thinking of alternatives, of what else could God mean behind this. Well, surely it's not, you know, to go physically walk on water because nobody can do that. Ha, ha, ha. So he must mean something else. And then that's how the word is complicated. And the evidence of men complicating the word is a lack of that power. It is the depression from a lack of change. But what if a person could exercise and had that voice of authority? Could they tell another how to achieve it? Nope. They could not. They could only ask a person to believe in the Messiah. But I tell you one thing they would not do. They would not alter scripture to fit unbelief. Hmm? Everybody think about it. Hasn't humanity altered the word of God to suit their unbelief? To make everybody comfortable in a powerless position? Haven't they? Saying, well, surely it can't mean this. Because nobody can do that stuff. So it must mean this over here, the alternative. That is foolishness it is nevertheless that's what happened now you have generations of people who are in fact powerless and when things when they can't command things they'll say well maybe god didn't do it because well maybe this isn't happening because forget it because do you want the truth or not because if you want the truth how long are you going to continue to believe those who were just like the Pharisees who adjusted the word of God to suit themselves? Somewhat radical. I'll believe it the way Jesus gave it. And when he said, those that believe upon him, and when you find out that we're on, that word on him, right, is a continual belief. It's a whole acceptance. When you believe in what he said, when you believe in what he did, when you have no problem with what he did. See, a lot of people, they say, oh, yes, I, you know, I believe in him. I believe he can do anything. <laughs> yeah, but you don't believe. He's in you and can work all things. So how can you believe in him and his power, yet you don't believe that same power and authority can reside within you? When you get angry at somebody else, you surely don't believe in the Lord's goodness for their life. You want them to pay for their stuff. Uh-oh, see how flesh creeps in and can destroy the simplicity of God's word. Then people get legalistic in the mind. And they try to put it in categories, just like a court. Well, this person did this, and so they start telling people, well, it's natural to want revenge. 
No, it is not natural. It is not natural. And people start saying, well, it's natural to be angry. No, it is not natural. It is not natural. Well, nobody can do so and so. No, you can't do so and so. Don't put that on everybody else. Until they totally pervert it. And now in the world, what do you see? Christians suing people. Christians wanting, saying, well, we need peace for the family. And the only way we can have peace for the family is to prosecute that person over there. That's not going to bring peace to your family. To see somebody else suffer for something that will not change a thing. You see what's happened? Something has crept in and taken over. And if you don't listen, th this conversation is spiritual. It's going to cause a spiritual fight. Just like you know that. It always happens. Maybe that's why the Lord has these things stretched out. It's going to cause a spiritual fight. Kick back. Right? Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. Now, what does he mean by that? Greater works shall he do, right? Greater works are you going to do than the works Jesus did, because he goes unto the Father. What does he mean? Let's continue. He says, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Pause. Pause. Now, how is it going to glorify God? How can God be glorified in the Son by doing what you want to be done? He just said, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. Whatsoever, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, whatsoever you ask in the name of Jesus. Jesus says, that thing I'm going to do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now, see, we have to face another truth here. A big one. He didn't say whatever you dream up. He said whatever you ask in my name. Now, when you ask something in somebody else's name, you cannot ask based on your own mind. You cannot do it. When you ask something in somebody else's name, you're acting in their stead. You have taken their place, and you operate accordingly. Hmm? You guys see that? That means I don't dream up something I think would be the best solution for somebody's life, and then ask that in the name of Jesus. No, that's not the way it works. To ask something in somebody else's name, let me describe this for you. If one of you were to do something in my name, you would have to know me. You can't do anything in my name unless you know me. You have to know me first. You have to know what Mike would do. You have to know what Mike likes and what Mike dislikes. Once you have those things, then you can do something in my name. See, if you do something in somebody's name, but you do it outside of their character, you're not bringing honor to anybody, are you? No. But if you do something in somebody's name, and you align with their qualities, you'll bring whoever you're doing that for, you're going to bring that person honor. In this case, Jesus said, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If the Father is going to be glorified in the Son... It must conform to the living God. It must truly be of the character of Christ. It cannot be what we want. And see, you know what people have been doing? They've been doing and trying to evoke things that they want, doing it in the name of Jesus. And when it doesn't happen, they say, well, it must not work that way. So let me start. You know, it must be an alternative. It must means something else. No, it doesn't. It means exactly what it means. But if I'm unforgiving to a person in this world, and yet I try to do something in the name of Jesus, Jesus did not walk around hating people and then smile in somebody else's face. He didn't do that. But he had to be thorough. When you're doing something in the name of Jesus, you're doing it in his place. Thank you, Lord. Did you, do you hear that? 
you're doing it in its place. That means you're not thinking up just some, I'm not going to think up some harebrained idea. I'm doing something in the stead, in the place of Christ. That's why he called us ambassadors. An ambassador does not do what the ambassador wants done. An ambassador does things in the name of the king. He represents a king in a foreign place. He does not do things based on what he thinks should be done. He does things based upon the quality, the personality, the characteristics, what is liked and disliked of that king. When you do something in the name of Jesus, you're doing something in the stead of Jesus, in the place of Jesus. You're not making up some new stuff. You're doing something in the place of Jesus, in the stead of Jesus. That's why he said you're ambassadors to Christ. Do you know what that means? So here comes the big one, truth moment. That means in you is an ability to really encapsulate who Christ is. There's an ability for you to have the mind of Christ. Do you hear me? You cannot discharge this statement, this phrase would have never been given if you had no ability to have the mind of Christ. You do have an ability to have the mind of Christ. So where's the problem? The problem is because you, we have experimented with the word of God to see what works and what does not. We've hybridized who Christ is in our own minds, which is why each person has a different interpretation of who the Lord is. That's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. No wonder. No wonder. No wonder people are powerless. No wonder people are powerless. Because everybody has a different Christ in their life. We're not to have a different Christ in our lives. Who in the world authorized that among mankind? That comes from people not being able to capture the power of the living God that they may do what Jesus did. See, people get angry when they cannot work the works Jesus did. I'll tell you something. Nobody's going to work the works Jesus did if they're trying to work it after their own mindset. They have to have the mind of Christ. You have an ability to have the mind of Christ. You know when somebody wrongs you? Listen, here's the mind of Christ. When somebody wrongs you, right? And in that moment, there's no hatred in you. None. You just simply forgive them. And you, you walk away humble. Forgiving that person. That person does not forgive you. You speak no ill will about them or anything else, but you absolutely forgive them from the heart. And you walk away almost petitioning for the person to find the truth one day. That's the mind of Christ. How many times did man essentially spit in the face of Jesus and he sought no vengeance? How many times? How many times did they defame him in front of everybody else? And he sought no retribution. How many times did the ones he loved, did he, they just simply laugh at him? And he loved them enough to understand where they were in life and still had the highest hopes for them. He loved those who hated him. He did good to those who despitefully used him. He did all manner of evil against them. He sent the disciples who became apostles back to the very ones who tortured and killed him. That's what he did. How can a person do that? How can a person ever do something like that? Because they truly believed in the salvation of the living God. When you don't believe in the Lord's salvation, when you do not believe in the Lord's salvation, guess what? You start coming up with alternatives. When you believe in the Lord's salvation, no one is exempt. You don't pick your own favorites. You have a heart towards all men. That means you will love your enemy as yourself. See how you don't have to try to love your enemy. When you truly believe 
in what your Father in Heaven was doing and is doing, you're naturally going to love your enemy as yourself. Do you know how many people have forced themselves to attempt to love their enemy? And they'll say, well, I'm not going to beat your brains in right now because the word says love your enemy as yourself, so I'm not going to touch you. But I make no promises next time. And that's useless because in your heart of hearts, you have something against them. You're just restraining yourself from acting on what you truly believe. See how that reveals a true belief? If you have to hold your tongue against someone, you have no good in your mouth or your heart for that someone. The key is get to the place where you never have to hold your tongue. That means you're purged. The one who is purged does not have that ill will in their heart. They never, they never have to bite their tongue. Why? Because the only thing that will come out of them, and you know the Bible says, what comes out of your mouth came from the heart. What overflows in your heart comes out of your mouth. If a person is purged, they never have to bite their tongue. Do you think man is in position for an ambassadorship with Christ when they operate the opposite of what the Lord said? Do you see the truth of it? You, come on now, this is a truth moment. Is it not a truth moment? Let me share this with you, right? Something is absolutely wrong. And forget about the world. Forget about politics. We're talking about those of us in the body of Christ. Something is wrong. It is too powerless. Why won't we ever admit that? And then do something about it. Do we really want what we want bad enough? That we will not start making the necessary corrections? How long do we continue to let this exist? How long will we deny? You know, a lot of people say, well, there's nothing wrong with me. The way I think of the word is perfect. That's the problem. That's pride that does that. Pride causes a person to believe that their viewpoint is perfect. Pride does that. Not truth. Truth will always give anybody a moment to pause. Truth will make a person never brag. You will never brag when you have the truth. See, we have an opportunity to get ourselves in alignment. We have an opportunity to do it again. Remember yesterday? Yesterday, today is a fresh, brand new start. Yesterday was too. Today is too. We can do it again. We can do it the right way. Making no promises, no declarations, no any of that. But to believe what's already been given to us. Thank you, Lord. Not searching for something more. See, you, uh, cheer me on this. You have a lot of people who want something more, yet, yet, too many of us have failed. We have failed to believe on the name of Jesus, which is that, that continual belief, not only in what he did, but what he stood for, what he's doing, what he said, what he believes in. Too many of us skip over that, and we want something more, don't we? Too many. It's time not to skip it again. It is time not to skip that again. Not to skip it again. But to finally begin to admit that, hey, we have bought, we, we drank the Kool-Aid here on earth, hook, line, and sinker. We did. We drank the Kool-Aid. We drank it. We drank the Kool-Aid. We believed because people were walking around powerless and they altered the gospel of Jesus Christ to suit their powerless state. And then we believed in the gospel based on someone who was powerless, who gave it to us, who compensated for having no power by saying the scriptures mean something different simply because something did not work for them. That's what man does. When something does not work for them, they alter the interpretation of scripture they alter it and make it easy for everybody else who is also powerless i don't want anybody who would ever agree to be powerless to interpret anything for me 
So let's look at the scripture one more time. Two of them. Jesus said, believe me that I'm in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Highlight that, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, which means whatever you do, if it aligns with the true character of Christ, it's going to do what? It's going to glorify the Father by the name of Jesus. Do you hear me? Not based on what we think that glory would be. It's going to honestly and truthfully glorify the Son in the Father. It's going to magnify Christ. Magnify his name. It's going to make solid who Jesus is. It will lift his name. See, when the name of Jesus is lifted up, that's when somebody else believes in Jesus of Nazareth because of something that just happened. When somebody is no longer broken and they give God praise because Jesus has healed them, because Jesus set them free. You guys see that? Not the alternative. Not to alter the word of God. Because people can't find the right formula to do their healing ritual. No, it's not by some ritual, by following certain steps. That's not what it is. It is by the authority of our Father. Look how it worked. Jesus said, these things you see here on this earth that are done, I didn't do them. The Father did those things. The Father doeth the works. That's what he said. The Father doeth the works. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. God does the works. Jesus was the willing vessel. God did the works. So if God did the works, he also approved of the works. And you're joint heirs with Christ? Which means one of the most important things to you is to have the mind of Christ. Because if you have the mind of Christ, you'll become a willing vessel of the power of the living God. Not to work your own stuff. Not a credit stealer. Do you guys know what a credit stealer is? Let me, let me explain this to you. It's a truth moment. People want to be recognized for something in the body of Christ. So listen to me carefully. That means they want the credit for knowing this and knowing that and doing this and doing that. They want the credit. If that were not so, not one Christian would ever brag on what they have done. They wouldn't discuss what they have done. And if somebody ever found it out, they would say, no, 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 don't look at me. That was the Lord's doing. Thank God for that. In fact, they would go out there and do something good. And nobody would even know that they did it. Because they would say, thank God for that. That's what they would say. Thank God for that. They wouldn't sit up there and take credit for that. But that's not what's happening, is it? What do you hear? You hear people say, well... I've come up with this theory, this idea, this, and I did this. Nobody else, just me. I did this. I want the I, 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 I. That's why, you know, that's why my life is such, because there are certain things I would like to do. I, I remember I was going to sit down and write a biography. Right? Then I thought about it. I, I can't do that. I can't do that. I was going to sit down and write uh, uh, some short stories. But then I said, no, I can't do that either. Because I don't want my name on there. I don't want, I don't want anything that would ever come back from it to go to me. See, because when you actually give something, when you are giving something, right, uh, truly giving something, you don't want it to come back to you. You want somebody else to start gaining from what you did. Right? You want somebody else free from what you did. That's what makes me no good in this world. I have such strong convictions behind this credit thing everybody wants. Strong convictions. 
I can't stand it. Because you jump into the rat race of who was the first to say this and who was the first to say that, who was the first to do this and to do that and to do this. A rat race. That's when your mind gets jumbled up and conflict comes in. And when conflict comes in, you know the flesh is at work. See, when the Lord is in the driver's seat, there is no conflict. That means it will be blessed. Well, the flesh is involved. You're going to have the conflict. You're going to have to work through it. Somebody says, do it anonymously. I already did it. It's out there. See how that works? It's already out there. It's already out there. It's under a pseudonym, but it's out there already. Isn't that funny? That's funny. You can't pay for it. It's free. It's already out there. People have referenced it, too. They have. It's absolutely free. It exists on its own. It was given through a peer-to-peer network. It spread out from there. It's already out there. There are so many papers that are out there, right? There, there, there are so many things out there. Listen, though. When you truly give something away and you do it anonymously, no one's going to know you ever did anything. I like doing things like that. Why? Because I do not want credit for any steps anybody would ever take. I wouldn't be able to muster a thing if it were not for Christ. Why in the world would I want the least amount of credit for doing anything like that? My goodness. Somebody says, why can't you share it with us? Chances are you've heard bits and pieces of it. Chances are. And chances are you're going to continue to hear about it. People have utilized it. We've already done that. I got past the copyright issue, the credit issue, all these other issues, and put it right out there to the people. Some people have torn it down, u- utilizing bits and pieces of it. That's great. I'm sure, I'm confident, all of you will see it in no time at all. Quite a few of them are confident of that. But I'm telling you right now, the Lord said, when you do your good, do your good deeds in secret that your father may reward you openly. Folks, back to this one statement. Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the father may be glorified in the son. Listen, that the father may be glorified in the son. So it's never what I think should take place. It is to have the mind of Christ. It is to have the mind of Christ that the Lord would be glorified in truth. Not what I think God's going to be glorified by. Do you all see that? Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do. God said he will do it. The Lord said he would do it. It'll be done. Whatever you ask in his name. Now we all know that if you ask something in the name of Jesus, but it's something that you thought of, Right? It often does not happen. But listen to me. Listen, you have an ability to have the mind of Christ. So that if you were moved, just I told you guys, I told you guys, I told you, I told you, I told you, it's going to cause a spiritual fight. Now, what in the world is the deal with this? Let me see. Let me look at my lights here. We're still up and operational. Give it a sec. Let's give it a sec. Let's see. They did. They lost all sound connection. Reconnection. No. There's nothing that should be. Let's do that. See where we are. It looks as if. Let me correct that. And correct this. This and this and this. And all streams are up and operational. I see feedback. Do you guys hear me on COT? Just refresh. Okay, you guys have sound on there. You guys do hear me at COT? Yes? Okay. They have sound. Mixler itself went out. So it's just Mixler. It would have to be the commercial stuff that goes first, huh? The commercial stuff just went out. Tools. Let's see if we can get that fixed here, guys. Reload devices. No, not doing that. Stop Mixler and start it back up again. Same. 
I'm going to start it back up again. Let's see if that makes a difference. Come on there, chop suey. It says the network's... Uh -oh. Turn it all the way off. Wait a minute, guys. Quit. Everybody stand by. I'm going to give a restart to this um, Mixler machine. I have to isolate Mixler when I'm running it. Mixler does weird things. All right, everybody who's on, who's still on the other networks, right? Stay on there. The sound is coming through. Let's see. I went to zero and then went back to six. You can hear me on six, too. So zero is good. Mixler is out for the moment. I'm going to get Mixler back up again, okay? The sound on Mixler never stopped. Some people are lagging behind. It most certainly did go out. Um, some people are way behind in Mixler, I've noticed. Some people are as far as 12 minutes behind on Mixler. So that stream going through Mixler has a 12-minute delay in some cases, right? Um, I'm going to restart Mixler, and the machine Mixler is on. I always have to run Mixler on a separate machine. I cannot run Mixler on any major machine. I don't want to tell you why, because that's bad marketing for Mixler, right? But I cannot run Mixler on a, on a, um, uh, a good machine. I can't do that. It is restarting for you guys, okay? It is restarting. So if somebody could convey all of that to Mixler, tell them that Mixler is restarting. The machine it resides on is restarting. It should be back up. Give it approximately four to five minutes. We'll be back up and running. Should be back up and running. But I told you guys, isn't that something? Huh. When, you, when you start talking about, or when you start talking about subjects that really get to the root of a spiritual breakthrough. That's when you face spiritual opposition. I told you guys it was going to start a spiritual fight. I told you guys that. Somebody tells everybody in, somebody hop into Mixler, please hop into Mixler and tell everybody that Mixler is restarting. Tell everybody that. Mixler is restarting, yes. Yeah, I saw that, unfortunately. Well, we know what that was, don't we? And it's the second. Well, we're going to get that. After we get this going, uh, I'm going to give, I'm going to give it a, uh, give everybody a break. I'm going to get this back and going again. Then I'll give everybody a break and um, a small break. My goodness, we have, I'm looking at one of the networks and um, the alarms are off the scales. They've been like that for the last uh, three days. Last three days, we've had geo alarms. And believe it or not, there's, there's, there are two geo alarms within the U.S. Let me see where these are, what towns they're in. These are pretty big geo alarms for the, we've never had a geo alarm like this, in the, not in the heart of the USA. We should not have a geo alarm like this in the USA. To be uh, candid with you guys, we should not have a geo alarm like this. It is not the New Madrid. Actually, it's in a weird place. We're not talking about the New Madrid either. This is uh, from Texas to Louisiana going right up into Arkansas. So it looks like part of the epicenter is in Arkansas. That must be oil related. We have another one in Wyoming and South Dakota. Big alarms going off in Wyoming and South Dakota. I hope it's not uh, gas again. There was a methane problem last time in Wyoming. It was. And South Dakota. Hopefully Colorado's not doing it. They still, you know, dabble with things and uh, that they do. Okay, guys, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see, would you like to view it now? No, I would not. Let's do this. This. We'll see where we are. And we are back up and running at three and four seconds. The stream is going. Okay, everybody, I'm going to go to music. I'm going to give everybody a break just for a few seconds. When we come back, we have to, we're going to hit some more of these uh, areas in here. I hope and pray that you guys are getting this. I know it's a life adjustment, right? But how many days does anybody want to continue to be powerless going forward from this day? You don't have to be powerless. You do not have to be powerless. Take that out of your mind. That somehow is going to take time for you to exercise certain powers. 
granted to you by the creator. Take that out of your minds. That is not the truth. It's not the truth. It is not the truth. That's not what the truth is. I'll be back in a few minutes right here at COT, everybody. I'm going to give this system time to relax. You guys and, and, and tell everybody else we're going to be back in a few minutes. We're on a break. I'll be right back. Everybody should be able to hear me. Mixler is back up and operational. I know we had a 7.4 earthquake in the Taiwanese area. We did. Everybody is back, correct? All right. Back to our conversation. Before the breakdown, right, which uh, is unfortunate, I told you guys it would be a spiritual fight. It always is. Some sort of spiritual fight. Do you know why? Because someone is going to get this. And if only one of you gets this, then good. That person will get it, and it'll start catching on. I'm going to go back to the point, though. It is so easy. It's so easy to accept the fact that a person is powerless. It is not so easy to accept the fact that Jesus said, those that believe on him, the works that he does, they're going to do in greater works than what he did will they do. See, it's not so easy. That is something absolutely and totally different, isn't it? That is something very different. That means uh, enough of the, you know, um, some of the other standards that have been happening. There's no way God's children are to be powerless. There's no way God's children are to be powerless. But there's something that has happened in the church. There's been a, some alterations in the church. There's been an acceptance of being powerless. And I am not one to accept being powerless. I am not. I've not been that way. When, when, see, when the Lord says you can accomplish something, why would anybody accept an alternate word? No. No. You know what the Bible, when it says you're in this world, but you're not of this world? You guys ever read that scripture? You're in this world, but you're not of this world. Right? Hmm. All these are hints. Hints. In, the, in Romans. In Romans. In Hebrews. In these books. You begin to capture that the prophets looked at you. They desired to be you. Why would they look at you? And desire to be you? Because you're the ones alive. After Christ. You're the ones that walk by faith. You're the ones that believe by faith. You're the ones that were given no proof of concept. You're the ones that if you believe in Christ, then Christ was revealed to you by the heavens, by God himself. Did you know that? If you believe in Christ, then that was given to you by the Father directly to you if you actually believe in Christ. We are the ones who became complacent with old ideologies, submission to darkness, cruelty, pain, and everything else. We suffer for it. Even the Lord said we would suffer for that. Today is that starting day. Today. Today is the day of salvation, yes, but today is also a starting point to begin to operate as Jesus said that we can operate. Not based on what we think is best for everybody else, no. But to actually have the mind of Christ, not the carnal mind, not all of our theories and ideas and everything else, no, but the mind of Christ. You have an ability to have the mind of Christ. You are, in fact, vessels of what is holy. Now, you all know Satan is sneaky, right? And so he brought up this concept of a hive mind mentality. So everybody stays away from a hive mind. Well, let me share something with you. If you are to have the mind of Christ, it's not your mind, is it? And if everybody has the mind of Christ, as the apostles did, 
in the New Testament where none of them had to speak to each other, but each knew what they had to do, and each went and did. Listen, it says they were of one mind, of one soul, that all things became common among them. That's when Ananias and Sapphira tried to defraud the Holy Spirit, keeping a little bit back from themselves, which was, by the way, foolish. It was theirs. It was theirs to give away or theirs to keep. And they held a little bit back for themselves, which is a twisted way that is not to be among us. Think about that. They didn't have to keep hide anything. It was theirs. It belonged to them. So when they came back, the guilt was so strong because they were recipients of the Holy Spirit. The guilt was so strong they gave up the ghost. They fell down dead. Nobody killed them. God did not kill them. God did not take their lives. Nobody took their lives. The guilt was so strong, they gave up the ghost. That is the truth they shared, how unbelievably pure it was. That never went anywhere. What has truly happened is because mankind is not they do not accept all of what Jesus is. Uh-oh, there it is. Truth time. The truth is, people do not want all of what Christ is. They do not agree with all of his gospel. They do not agree with his policies. That's the truth. And instead of craving this flesh way, it could be a tiny way, right? Instead of surrendering that and wholeheartedly agreeing with Christ, they would rather compromise the word or sidestep the word of God to keep away of the flesh, to continue to practice things of the flesh. Now, hear me out on this. No one forces anybody to repent. No one does. No one is forcing anybody to do good. No one is. It's up to you. It's up to you to choose it. So the question is this. Knowing what you know about Christ, knowing that he did not punish anybody, he didn't, knowing that he did not seek revenge, knowing that he did nothing by force, do you agree with his way? Do you agree with forgiving everybody and not prosecuting everybody? Because, listen, you cannot be a friend of the world and truly accept all of what Jesus is. Why do you think I'm so quirky half the time? Because it's a conflict where you would want to do one thing or do something in the world that's standard, right? There's a conflict in the spirit. People have wronged me, and other people used to get mad at me because I would not prosecute the person who wronged me. Here's a good one. Here's a good one. Suppose somebody wrongs somebody else in your life. You know that society mandates that if you love someone, you're to get that person back, right? Suppose you're married, and somebody says something inappropriate to your wife in public in front of everybody. Oop, this is a hard one. Society mandates you not sit there like a bump on the log and do nothing. Even your wife will say, well, aren't you going to do anything? But see, that's not the way of Christ, is it? You, you see what you have to give up? Do, do you guys see? This is the conflict. Now, if you do it the Lord's way, it, it's going to look like you're going to lose everything in your life. I'm telling you that by experience. Because you're going to find out quickly how many do not agree with the way of Christ. How many will easily choose the world's methods over the Lord's methods. The Lord said, love your enemy as yourself. The, less said, the, the Lord said, bless those who curse you. Do good to those who despitefully use you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you for his name's sake. Right? That's what the Lord said. But people demand something else. What will you do? Because I'll tell you something. You start going down this road, and let me, let me share this with you. Your love of Christ, your love of the Father and who they are, that's going to grow, but so long as the world is kind to you, you can never make the difference. 
people won't allow that. The interpretation of love on the earth won't allow that. It won't. People demand, right, that if you love someone, you, you have to shield and guard and protect them, which in part is true. But when you love your Lord and Savior, and when you love the Father's ways, everything else goes underfoot. Everything else is secondary, and the world is not going to like you. And your first opponent to you keeping those spiritual ways is going to be those closest to you. Of course, Satan is going to devise some sort of scenario to cause you, to cause you to seek revenge or to pay somebody back because your spouse is with you, because somebody you love is with you. Right? Because if you don't do anything, they'll say, well, you just, you're not protecting me at all. You don't love me at all. This, that, and that's what they'll say, right? So you're calling a compromise. So here's the deal. How many are ready to lose everything? See, that's a hard one. You have to be prepared to lose everything. Listen to me. You have to be prepared to lose everything. See, this is why you just don't jump into it. The Lord said, it is a, it's a foolish person. Who puts his hand to the plow, starts plowing, and then looks back to second guess what he has started. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but that's very foolish. You have to count the cost. Jesus said count the cost. Don't put your hand to the plow unless you understand the workload in front of you. Once you put your hand to the plow, then go all the way. But anybody who looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus said. Huh? Remember when he said, take up your cross daily? Bear your cross daily? Remember that? Remember when he said, if you don't hate mother, brother, sister, father, and all these other individuals, right? If you don't hate them, you can't devote your whole self to Christ. You can't do it. Why? Because your mother, your brother, your sister, your spouse, or somebody that you love is always going to have you compromise. Somebody's going to wrong them. They're going to demand that you do something about it. It'll always happen that way. There's no way out of it. You have to be ready to lose everything for the sake of Christ. Now you can understand why a person must consider the cost. It will, I'm telling you right now from experience, it's going to look like it's going to cost you everything. Or I actually put my hand to the plow. I knew it would cost me everything because I believed in the scriptures. And I counted the cost and I thought about it. And I went headlong, I mean headlong into it. Have I lost things? Sure. Sure. But there's nothing I can lose here on this earth that I will not regain in the eternal realm. Hmm? Do you know that? Nothing. So that's why a person might ask, well, why do you sit alone like that? You know, why are you like the way you are? All people do not agree with the Lord's way. Just don't. Some may not understand it. We just don't follow the Lord's way because people understand it. It's a life commitment. It's not something you do on Sunday, right, and then go back to your life on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday. No. It's something you commit your whole being towards. That's why you have to count the cost. Many people say, well, Mike, you know, I'm on my own. Are you kidding? You've been positioned to walk the walk and you don't even know it. It is incredibly difficult to walk that walk with a family. It is. And the Lord even tells us of this. It is. But when you've been positioned, many of you are by yourselves. You, you say, I'm lonely. Just, what are you doing? You have been positioned to do a great work. See, the truth is in your heart of hearts, you want to do a great work for the Lord, but you're torn by the flesh. Or sing it for what it is. You're the one with the heart that wants to serve the Lord more than anybody else. Your greatest frustration is that you cannot do it. It never comes to fruition. Why? 
is because you're always looking for that companion. You're always counting what you lost, what you're missing. You're not looking at the blessing before you. If you're by yourselves, you can do a complete work in the Lord without the hindrances. Are, are you kidding? In my personal life, nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing remains that I used to have or that I was. Everything is altered. Everything is. Does it get me down and out? Am I depressed? No, I'm not depressed. I'm incredibly blessed. I can't do this. What I'm doing right now, there's no way I could ever commit to this or do this. With all this other stuff pulling me in, in different directions. I've been there before. It does not work. That's why the Lord said count the cost. It's going to seem like you're losing a lot. Now this brings up the last thing. Those who operate by the power of the Holy Ghost. Everybody did not operate that way. Because when you're honest with yourselves, some of you have families that you love, right? And so there are certain things you already know they will not understand. The Lord's not going to have you compromise them for the sake of himself. He'll never put you in that position. Do you know that? He's not going to do it. And so there's a specific call for each of us. Now, here's what this means, though. Those who will walk around operating by the power of the Holy Ghost, they have access to you. You may not be able to commit fully. You know what? The apostle talked about this in the New Testament. He said, when you're married, your servitude is going to be divided between your spouse or the opposite side of you and the Lord. He already said that. He said, when you're single, right? That's why he said, this confuses people. This is in the Bible. He said, if you can help it, don't get married. So you can devote yourself 100% to Christ. He said, but everybody is not made that way. And some people have to have physical, right? That, that, that physical satisfaction. He said, if you're one of those people, right? Not everybody is made to forego that. Not everybody is made to forego that, to be a monk, essentially. Not everybody is made that way, right? But he says when you, simply because you have a spouse and a family, right, that means your, your, your heart's going to be divided between the work of the Lord and your spouse. By honor, by God's honor, it's going to be divided because you are seen as one flesh. You can't abandon your family to serve the Lord. You cannot do that. You can't do that. But those of you who don't have another half, who God has set free time and time again, let me talk to you for a minute. See, the Lord has shown you that, yes, you can operate by yourselves, but you keep running back to go and get something hitched or tied to yourselves. You're the ones with the heart to serve the Lord 100% without compromise. Yet you look at everybody else in the world and you say, well, I want somebody too. And the Lord keeps demonstrating to you. He gave you the insight. He gave you the heart to follow him all the way 100%. He gave you that heart to do what nobody else is willing to do. You're the one that can sit in these small cramped in areas. Everybody else has to take a vacation, not you. Everybody else has to get out and get fresh air in this, not you. Your mind is in the work already. You can stay focused on things. You just have to say yes to it, right? You cannot compare yourselves to those in the world. Married couples, when you serve the Lord, as much as you're able to serve him together. Don't ever expect your spouse to have your mindset. You constitute one flesh. God will see you as one. So don't throw the other one under the bus, because God will see you as throwing yourself under the bus. You carry the penalty of the one you're with. You can also be the covering of the one you're with. Don't fall for the okey-doke of Satan who would say, well, you know, you got to get away from your spouse. That is hogwash. That's absolute hogwash. You do what you have to do to work it out. If there's physical abuse, the vow is broken. I'm just letting you know that. And if you've been one of those who physically abused your spouse, get it right, right now. If you're abusive verbally or physically, get it right, right now. Because your soul is in danger. 
God will save the one and allow you to keep falling if you continue on that path. Get it right. But don't sit there and find an excuse to end your marriage because you want something better. Stop doing that. That's Jezebel junk. That's what that is. If you're divorced, stop trying to rush and go find somebody to fill a void. Stop doing that. You're still with the Lord. The Lord knows all of your needs. Stop trying to rush and keep the standards of the world thinking that somehow if you had somebody else, they're going to complete your life. They cannot complete your life. Haven't we learned that? People cannot complete your life. The Lord can, but people cannot. How many times are we going to fill that void up with everything only to find out it does not work? Let me share this with you. I shared this at the beginning of talking to people and COT is something I believe in and operate by. You ready? Those of you who have a yearning for somebody else, you're all depressed and in the corner, right? You want somebody with you, but nobody's with you. is causing you to have an attitude. Stop it. Listen to me. Find peace by yourself. Find wholeness by yourself. And somebody will come along and compliment the wholeness and the peace. If you find somebody in your brokenness, they're going to be broke too. And when you're repaired, they're still going to be broke. You're going to find a problem with that. What I'm telling you is find repair first. Become satisfied, content with who God made you to be. Start maximizing in it. Find your peaceful place by yourself. Listen, a person can come along and compliment anything within you. They cannot complete you. They can only compliment it. So then find peace. Find joy when you're by yourself and somebody will come along and compliment it. Do you hear what I'm saying? Somebody will come along and compliment it. But don't ever think somehow a person is going to make you fulfill everything about you. That's a lie. That's a big lie. Only your Father in Heaven can complete you that way. So you find peace and stability in that good place within yourself by yourself. And somebody, sure enough, they'll walk along and compliment it. Once you are at peace, once you are restored, by yourself. God can send someone to compliment it. But when you're down and out, stop trying to find someone to share that with. No, that's when you seek the Lord. That's when you, you take advantage of that new start with Christ. You say, okay, Lord, I just totally messed that up. I totally messed it up. Let's get a new start going. Yes, it's going to be painful. Yes, it's going to be different, but do it. You're in the last hours. Remember that. Don't fall for the okie doke. I know too many people who they thought somebody else was going to complete them, and four years later it turns into a disaster. Five years later, a disaster. You don't want to waste another five years of your life, do you? Then start trusting in the ways of the Most High. See, this is it. This is the difference. The ways of the Most High are different than the ways of men. They're different. God is your pathway to freedom. Christ is that beacon that you follow on that pathway to freedom. God can lead you there. He will not lead you astray. Everything else will. You guys getting this so far? My, we didn't get anywhere. We got stuck in John, didn't we? My goodness. So listen, once you're aligned, once you're aligned, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, Jesus says, that will I do. Jesus said he would do it. Whatever you ask in my name, Jesus said he would do it. He would do it. You don't have to do it. He said he would do it. Listen, he does it for a reason. And what is the reason? That the Father may be glorified in the Son. He said he would do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. He's going to do that thing you ask, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. He is not going to do that thing you ask, so that you can get all the credit for it. He's not going to do that thing you ask so that somebody can look at you and say, oh, thank you, that prayer worked on me. That's not why he's doing it. That's giving you glory and need not be glorified. We all know the spirit in man. Man need not be glorified. Jesus said he would do it that the Father may be glorified in the Son. It's a key that should be on your, your spiritual key ring. 
if the Father can be glorified in the Son, not you, but in the Son, now you're in alignment. Huh? Now you're in alignment. Jesus said not one thing he did. He did of his own, but the Father did that through him. Thank you, Lord. The Father did it. And so what I'm telling you as being a joint heir with Christ, if you're going to be a vessel, you're not doing what you think should be done. You're a vessel for the power of the living God, for what he wants done. When you are in alignment, you're not going to ask for anything you think should happen. You're going to ask for those things that the Father would be glorified in Jesus Christ. It would bring Jesus glory. You're not going to do anything where you would get the glory. You're not going to do anything so somebody looks better of you. No. Everything you do is going to be to bring the Father glory through his son, Jesus. Listen, the whole key is that the Father may be glorified through his son, Jesus. If we do something here at COT, it's not for my edification. It's that the body of Christ is edified. How is the body of Christ edified? How is the, ed- it, the, the body of Christ is edified when the Father is glorified in the Son? See, the whole key is that everybody go to Jesus, correct? Without Christ, there is no salvation. Why would God lift up anything else? Come on now. Why would he lift up anything else if the key to salvation is Christ? Then why would he lift up something outside of Christ? When Christ is the most important, that is the most important objective right now. Why would he lift up anything else to confuse anybody? He's not doing that. The Father's being glorified in his son Jesus. And you know what the word says for those who are in compliance? That through you, Christ will be glorified. My goodness. Do you see how that works? Now, Jesus is saying he'll do it. He'll do it. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. And then Jesus turned around and told us that through us, he will be glorified. See how that all works together? No exception. See that? So what's in the way? It's when people want credit for doing something. If a person wants credit for doing something, right, then they want the glory. They want the glory. That's the problem. They want to be recognized. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't want to be recognized. I want the Lord to be recognized. I don't want the appreciation. I want the Lord. I want people to appreciate what Jesus is doing. The only way people can appreciate what Jesus is doing and truly magnify his name is that they know the truth of who's doing everything that is found in holiness and righteousness that makes that true impact in their life. That is Christ Jesus. Me, I'm just like the dust here today, gone tomorrow. When I'm gone, the Son still exists. When I'm gone, the Father still exists. When I'm gone, salvation, hopefully, is still here. No one need to remember me. They need to know Jesus, don't you think? So why would God magnify me? That's why I I don't like credit for things. That's why I redirect on many things. Don't give me a bunch of thanks. It goes right to the Savior because I couldn't do anything outside of him. I don't want anybody's approval. I don't want any of that. Because I know if you know who Jesus is for real, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. If you know who Jesus is, you're going to be okay. Agreement with the character of Jesus, the words of Jesus, the doings of Jesus. That is key. That is key. Somebody has a question in, in for Revelation. They said, during the thousand year reign, let me go back. Let me see what it says. Let me go back. It's a pretty good question. I'll answer that one. Let's see. It says, uh, the person says, if we are made whole and the ones that take the mark are gone, how are the normal people there? The ones who take the mark, right? When you go back into Revelation, you'll see it, the thousand year reign. There's going to be a whole population of people here on the earth. The judgment, judgment or second death does not take place until after that thousand year reign. 
right? After the thousand year reign, after that thousand years is expired, everything is brought to a total consummation, right? After it's expired, before it's expired, those who were faithful to Christ, those who got the victory over the mark will rule and reign with Christ. They'll rule and reign with, who are they going to rule and reign over? They're going to be people born into that system, right? They're going to be born into that system. Many of those people will partake of the, all of those people are going to partake of the second death. That's why reading Revelation in context is so incredibly important because how many times do you guys hear about the thousand year reign? You don't, do you? It's almost like people, it's almost like it's skipped over. Nobody wants to address the thousand year reign. The thousand year reign is one of the most important events in the book of Revelation. It is extremely important. I mean, extremely important. And when you, when you go into the book of Revelation, right, and you're reading that, it is, it is, it is incredibly clear, right? Blessed and holy is he that hath part first resurrection on such a second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And listen, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. See, that's when stuff goes downhill. And shall go out and deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. God may God to gather them to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So after that thousand years, they're kaput. Those who were faithful with Christ will rule and reign with Christ. But there's still other people on the earth. Suppose, suppose, suppose those who are in the kingdom of the beast, right? Listen, listen, those who are in the kingdom of the beast, who are worshiping the beast and the dragon and all this other stuff, right? Right? Who accepted that mark. They are marked themselves. Those who had the marking of the beast are marked for doom. Now it says this, and I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark on the foreheads or their hands. Or, and, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Right? Now listen to this. Listen, let me go back. I'm going to step it back. This is when the dragon is bound. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. And a seal was set upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So Satan was bound a thousand years, but not the rest of the people. The rest of the people are still here on earth. And instantly when Satan is bound, they're no longer deceived. When Satan is bound, they're not deceived anymore. When Satan is bound, they're not deceived anymore. It does not mean they're going to heaven. It means they're not deceived anymore. Then when Satan is loosed out of his prison, those same people are deceived again. See that? So it, God takes all those people who had received the mark of the beast, many of them, right? They're still alive when Satan is bound. They're still alive. They didn't die. They're still alive. They're still alive. The only difference is without Satan. They're not doing evil things anymore. They start saying the truth. Here's the problem. You ready? Here, God is showing us something. The people who receive the mark of the beast, as soon as Satan is bound, they're not sinning anymore. They're not doing that stuff anymore. They have a change of heart. But as soon as Satan is loosed again, they agree with him. What is God demonstrating? Jesus already gave us a principle. He said, the will of your father, you will do. Anybody who belongs to Satan, if Satan's influence is taken away, those people can be good again. They'll operate under the standing influence. As soon as that influence is let loose again, because Satan is in them, because they're truly part of him, they're going to be loyal to him yet again. Not God's people. God's people are going to be loyal to the father. Satan's people are going to be loyal to him. The wheat and the tear. See? See how that is? So they go through a thousand years. They're having children, everything else, living in holiness, learning the Feast of Tabernacles, having the example right in front of their face. Most of those people who worship the beast would say, well, you know, I couldn't go with Christ because I had no proof. So God gives them proof of reprieve. They have proof. They see the miracles. They see his rule and his reign, and they still choose Satan in the end. See that? They still choose him in the end. 
no matter what God does, they're always going to be drawn to darkness. Now, you can't bring anybody like that into an eternity full of light. They won't survive. Any darkness that's introduced, they'll gravitate towards that. Period. Do you see that? Do you see it? People right now, I've heard people say, people say, well, how come God can't save the tares? You're not understanding, are you? The tares are the opposite of you. How you long to show compassion to a person, right? They long to disrupt a person. They fake compassion. And it, it takes everything of them to fake having compassion. Just like it takes everything of you to fake like being a person in the world. And it does. For those who are righteous, it takes all your energy to act like you're one of those in the world. I mean, it, it hammers you down to the ground. You're walking around with guilt and everything else because you truly belong to the living God. Tears do not have that guilt. When they're among the righteous, they expend everything to act like the righteous, but the darkness in them, it just exudes out, it just keeps coming out. So they try very hard to be nice. And they cannot maintain it. When Satan is loosed again, he'll go out and deceive them. And they're bought to their final judgment. Period. Do you see that? No matter what God does, they are born of darkness. That's why they're wheat in the tear. They're born of darkness. Jude, the book of Jude spoke about them. They, they are pre determined or preordained to be ungodly men they're spots in your feasts of charity so where are they they're among you right now they're the ones that come christ gave us a simple doctrine i'm telling you what they do they come in and complicate the word of god and they teach people listen to me they teach people judgment one of their major sermons that they give is how you're supposed to judge another person if you tell a tear, you are not to judge. They can't even make sense of it. If you tell a tear, you are to forgive and not judge. They cannot make sense of it. Do you hear me? They have no understanding of that. No understanding of that. They have none. And so what they do is they come in and say, oh, yes. Oh, yeah, you are to judge. And they start bringing up scriptures, you know, doing the little combative thing. That's what they are. Why do they believe that so much? Because darkness in them. They're the ones that compensate hatred. They're the ones that compensate anger. They're the ones that compensate all this worldly stuff. They do that. They do that. They do that stuff. And they all do the exact same thing. And when you don't agree with them, if somebody comes in with a message of judgment and you don't agree with their message of judgment, they get angry at you. They can't help themselves. That's just who they are. God's children are full of forgiveness. They have no desire to judge. They get frustrated. They get angry. They think people should pay for things. But ultimately, they forgive. They talk too much sometimes, but they, they're very forgiving people, and compassion always wins out to their own hurt. A person who comes from the Father will forgive a person even to their own hurt. They may talk like they don't accept it. They may truly want somebody to, to, to see what they're doing wrong. The major thing God's children want somebody to see is what they are doing wrong. They don't necessarily want the person to pay for what they're doing. They want a person to see what they're doing wrong. What are the major cries of a person who belongs to the living God who is here on this earth? Is that God show them what they're doing to hurt God's vessels. Like if a person is hurt by somebody else, they'll say, God, please show them how they're hurting me. That's one of the major prayers of those who belong to the Most High. They don't sit up there and say, God, get them. Pound them over the head with a lightning bolt. That's not what they do. Why? Because they're so full of conviction. They're full of conviction. Heirs believe in judgment. When Jesus specifically said, judge not that ye be not judged, did he not? And there are seven definitions of judgment based upon the context utilized within the Bible. Why won't people inspect them? Me? I follow Christ. 
Jesus already told me, judge not that you be not judged. Hmm? Judge not that you be not judged. Somebody says, I know you don't talk about the rapture, but what happens to those Christians who don't believe? I can't see the time, who don't believe and can't see the time we live in. I have an aunt that refuses to believe. Well, here's the thing. Listen to me. Don't be fooled by that. Don't be fooled. Just because a person says they don't believe does not mean they don't believe. No, 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 no. No. If a person belongs to the living God, it does not matter what they say. They're coming home. Period. Right? Don't. You got to be careful with people's words. They will say things. Right? Right? And then you're really thinking they're telling the truth about what they're saying. you got to be careful with that. Most people, when they convey things, they don't quite really convey things the right way. Right? Don't worry about what another person believes. You're not here to make anybody believe. You don't have to worry about that. Right? I'll tell you something. This may seem harsh at first, but if you hear me, it will not seem harsh at the end of it. You ready? If a person, Jesus will, that people are going to stand before Christ. And for those who don't make it, he's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Now listen to me. If Christ never knew them, they were never your family. Do you hear me? Now, how many of you want Satan to be your family member? How many of you want a demon to be your family member? Type of one if you want demons to be your family member. Type of one if you want Satan to be your uncle. Go ahead, type of one. No ones, right? No one. I don't want Satan to be my family member. I do not want a demon to be my family member. I don't want the souls of the fallen, the evil spirits known in the earth to be my family members. So guess what? If Christ never knew them, he never knew them. They never belonged to him. Listen to me carefully. Listen to me carefully. Right? Listen to me carefully. These people on the earth, no matter who they are, they could be your spouse, they could be your, your uncle, they could be your children. If they do not belong to the living God, they're not going to end up with them. Do you hear me? They're not. They're not going to end up with them. Period. They're going to stand before Christ. He's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. And do you not know that you're not going to know them either? They're not your family. They're not. That's why you cannot sit up and worry yourself to pieces about somebody else's belief. Because you don't know what they are. The Lord said for us to love our enemies. We give everybody an opportunity. We live genuine within our calling, which is to love all mankind. God knows who's a tear and who is not. Now, for a person that's out there talking foolishness, if they truly belong to the living God, Jesus said this, all who come to me, the Father hath given me, and I will in no wise cast out, and I will raise him up the last day. That means no matter how messed up their doctrine is, Jesus has the responsibility to keep them. He might have to bring them through something hefty, so be it. But he's keeping them. Do you hear me? So if they truly are your family, they're going to be your family. God did not give us the ability to know the difference between the two. He did not. And he did that on purpose, that we would be genuine. So we wouldn't walk around condemning people. See how that works? So when it comes to worrying about your, 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 your aunt believing this, or your uncle believing this, or your spouse believing this, nope, 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 that's not your place. You can pray for them. You can pray that the Lord use you to help them understand more and more. But it's up to them to choose. Everyone must choose themselves. Everyone. Remember that. Never worry about who believes and who does not believe. No. Worry about your representation and your ambassadorship of Christ. You're the Bible they read without opening a book. Never forget that. You are the Bible they read. Why do you think they know what you're doing all the time? You're the Bible they read. You make the difference in somebody else's life. Huh? You do that. Brother Mike, is the devil's cometh the pale horse? I don't believe. 
a common is any of those horses. That's just my belief. I believe those horses are just what the Bible describes them to me. They're spirits let loose in the earth. The lamb does this. When the lamb lets loose one of those horses, right? The lamb does this when he breaks the seals. And by the way, in Revelation, Jesus said the time is at hand. That means it was already happening back then. So when those horses are let loose, they are spirits that dominate people. Like when he says he lets the first, the white horse loose, right? Who goes forward to conquer, right? He has a, he has a bow with no arrow. He has a crown and he went forth to conquer, right? So then that spirit of conquering went out into the earth. What do kings of the earth desire to do to other nations to conquer them, right? Isn't that what all the wars and rumors of wars have been about, right? It has been about conquering the other place. It's like they're preoccupied with having dominion over everything they can have dominion over. Do you see that? Do you all see that? So it never, it, it, a, a comment, no. These are, in, in what the Lord gave me was these are spirits that will dominate the earth. When they're let loose, they will go to and fro in the earth, and they will, they will influence many things in the earth, right? Many things in the earth. That's what the Lord gave me. It's already happened, though. See, one thing people miss in Revelation, it says the time is at hand, and that's a 2,000-year-old book. It says the time is at hand. So that means it's not going to happen. It's been happening. But how does the person who's born in the middle of this stuff identify what season they're in? They'll be born into a world full of iniquity, wouldn't they? Full of iniquity. Where people teach iniquities. Where policies are iniquitous. Where it's okay to be half nude all the time. It's okay to curse. It's okay to be in absolute rebellion against the living God. And the lands would make rebellion against God legal. They'd be born in the middle of that. How would they know that they're in the middle of a mess? That's why God sends people. That's why the Spirit fills you. So you can be that ambassador. That you may be that voice of truth and of reason that conveys the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and of the time we live in. And anybody who reveals that truth, God watches over his word to perform it. Because remember, it's not your truth, it's God's truth. And when it's released, God will watch over it to perform it. For example, if, if you were to speak a truth and then all of a sudden say, I don't know, I'm just paraphrasing. So that God seal this word, right? A great mountain will blow its top. And you give a time or some weird thing like that. But that was, that's what the Lord gave you. Then guess what? Everybody who heard the word you gave, and when they see the mountaintop blow, you've already given the word. When they see the mountaintop blow, they're going to remember that word. Kind of like that. Kind of like that. God has no problem sealing his words with activities in the earth. He has no problem doing that. Now, we're not talking about some hoodoo voodoo stuff where people jump around in circles trying to blow the top of a mountain off. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about a psychic who says, oh, or the, you know, the spirits walked and they showed me an earthquake. And, and, you know, like the New Madrid, people have worn the New Madrid out. People have had more earthquakes than the Madrid fault has. Think about that. Listen. Mankind's mind goes to what is natural for it to go to. When something is mentioned a lot and people suspect something is going to happen, they start going back to these known areas. I'm telling you right now, it's the unknown areas that are going to cause the damage. Everybody looked at Yellowstone. Yellowstone, by somebody's declaration, is supposed to blow up every single month. It has not, has it? It's going to be the places you never thought of. It's going to be those things that are quirky. Something you never thought of. The Lord will not fail to have you know about these things. Like 9-11. That was known about by many in the body of Christ. And people would not listen. They wouldn't listen. They just wouldn't listen. Right? God doesn't do this to impress people. He does all things to bring his word to fruition because he speaks truth. God's not, he's also not giving a forecast, if anything. No, he's telling you what he's going to do. He's telling you what he's going to do. 
So, Brother Mike, I had a, I had a talk about uh, polar lights today. Will those orange orbs appear simultaneously to it's a possibility, but they will tell you to get out the way. Mike, are you ever going to teach on the book of Isaiah in conjunction with the book of Revelation? Yes. Oh, yes. See, we're supposed to get to the seals today, right? We we're supposed to get to the seals, which would have brought us to Matthew 24, Luke 21, all those books, which would have led us to the book of Jeremiah, because we need the book of Jeremiah, which would have corroborated the book of Isaiah and the book of Daniel, which would have brought us back to Ezekiel. That's what we were getting at. Right? These things are plotted out, too. They have to be plotted out so that all of us have those plots. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something right, Johnny, up front. It is not what you want to hear. It is what the Lord has decreed. The Lord has decreed some things that humanity does not want to hear. They don't. For example, for example I'm going to give you an example. We've had a financial collapse by declaration of people every year, every month of every year, and every week of every month, haven't we? In other words, somebody always says a financial collapse is coming, right? We've had no financial collapse. A lot of people look to Revelation and say that means a financial collapse. That is not what the Lord showed me. He didn't show me that. He showed me something would be established where people would have to use money to buy things. A common system around the world. It's already established. Now, proof of concept is things are about to get a whole lot sweeter. Do we just ignore the book of Daniel when it says that this Antichrist is going to, he's going to scatter among them the prey, the spoils, and the riches? That he's going to overcome people with flatteries. And because he can back up things with riches, right? Which means he's going to distribute wealth to a lot of people. Do you know what's happening in the Middle East? The Middle East is going to be the number one place in the entire world. Watch and see. They have left the U.S. as far as money. The U.S. has been lying as far as its, its, uh, its standing in the global system. Everybody has already left the dollar, right? There's a new currency in the market. The government is quickly putting that digital dollar to work. Things are about to get a whole lot sweeter. You guys will have money. You may not have product, but you're going to have money, and something is about to happen to the oil. The grass in many parts of the USA are going to be at least four foot high from nobody cutting grass. There will be a policy put in place where nobody can drive cars, too. We're still going to have electricity. Forget about an EMP. We're going to have electricity. But we, there's going to come a time when people will not be using gasoline. Get ready for that. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. So something is going to happen to the fuel. We're still going to have electricity. Policies will, policies will change in such a degree that every family is going to have money, but they will not have product. What is one way that we won't have product and that something has happened to our fuel, our standing with the rest of the world? If we fall out of favor with the Middle East, we're going to suffer by way of fuel, right? Especially after hours catches on fire from a coastal meteor storm. Texas will burn from below and from above. Fires will come from both the ground and the heavens, and this will happen in Texas. You got to get ready. Got to get ready for that. China is going to pull a nifty 50 on us, and they've already made arrangements to bypass us in a lot of trade, and they have been trading outside of us, which has enriched Iran a great degree. Iran is far richer. And any of you suspect they are not some backwoods people. It is different than what they're, listen, a lot of the stuff you hear on television is propaganda to perpetuate a consistent lie to people is not how they have been portraying it to you. It is not. People in the USA, a lot of people in, in, in certain countries are duped by propaganda, by continual repetitious teachings which are much like incantations like somebody humming the same thing over and over again until everybody else starts humming the condition of this world is far different you will find that out you'll find that out this year and there's no need to get upset i'm sure that every single generation there have been lots of people who've been trying to tell folks things are not what the world says they are. So God said, right, in the book of John, that the world does not have the truth. If the world does not have the truth, then why do we continue to live our lives by the truth of the world if they don't even have the truth? 
and you watch. Listen to me carefully. Many people have compromised for the sake of money. Please hear me on that. Many people have compromised. When I say compromise, they start speaking the same junk the world speaks because of money. Anybody can smile when they have money. We're about to find out who can smile without money. Then we're about to see who's comfortable when they have money, but they don't have product. That's when the trains will run. See, we're in trouble. The USA is in trouble right now. In trouble. Right now, we're in trouble. has nothing to do with what you think it has to do with. The USA is in trouble, and nobody's doing anything about it. Or do we have some discussions to be had here in this place? I know I'm not going to be liked because of these discussions. I'm not. But in this case, conviction wins. And no one is warning anybody about a meteor storm. A meteor storm or actual impacts to the ground. These will be actual impacts to the ground. We cannot dodge the junk we're about to go through. Somebody said, Mike, you have referred to the destroyer and binary system. What is the designation NASA and other agencies have given, given what have Give it as they track it is the Nibiru or enter they don't use that name Nibiru. Keep in mind that in the in the tracks themselves, right? They would rather use a name like Nemesis or something like that, right? It has a designation. Not important for people to know that. It is important that they're tracking something and it's not just one object, it's several objects. Several. So it's a it's a known thing, right? It's not some mythical thing, it's a known thing. Right? It does not operate the way that most people believe it does. You, you have to keep in mind, people have attempted to interpret books by themselves. And then they believed in their own interpretations. That's not how things are working. Believe me when I tell you that people are going to have no warning. And the effects will be upon this planet so fast. It'll make your head swim. It'll be like today. And then it won't be like today. It'll happen just like that. It'll be just like today, and then it won't be like today. You're not going to get a warning of it. You're not. Now it's a small example of that. Listen to me. You're not going to get a warning of the two, or it could be up to four, that will impact in the waters. And one on land. That's going to cause a major fire. Potentially a major crater. That's three in the ocean. One. You think anybody's going to warn you about that? No, they will not. They're not going to warn you about it. They only warn you about those things that they can't control. If they can't control it, if they can't use it, they can't get you to, to bow down to it, they're not going to tell you anything about it. Then they're, and, and I told you guys I was going to tell you something about uh, one of the biggest enemies that's coming. You ready? It's called the wind. The winds are coming. And I pray that all of you get ready for the winds. It's going to bring about the real change. And I mean actual winds. The wind blowing. The wind that you go outside and say, Ah, oh, what a breeze. That wind. That wind is going to be an enemy. Please get ready for some of the fastest wind humanity has ever experienced. Okay, folks. That's it for tonight. I'm going to say God bless each and every one of you. And I, I, I am going to see you guys next time right here at COT. We may have a couple of broadcasts tomorrow. I've got to test out some more of the system, right? I'm going to also have, uh, well, well, you'll see tomorrow. I'm not going to tell you guys anything about it. But tomorrow, I'm going to see you guys tomorrow. Listen, I always appreciate these gatherings. I know sometimes I can be quirky, weird, strange, all the, all the above, right? All the above. But I hope that tonight. You really got the heart of our conversation at the beginning, which is, which is, which is our agreement with everything of Christ. Please go back and read John 14, 10 and John 14, 14. Read all that again. Make sure that you highlight uh, the, those passages in there, uh, scripture fragments, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. That's the reason for the alignment of all things, right? Please have an understanding of that. There are too many powerless folks in the body of Christ that should not be powerless, and the Lord is doing an awesome work. 
And it really is. This really is a new start day, but it requires our absolute honesty with self, with conviction, with the Most High, and with everybody around us. Never be ashamed of who God made you to be, right? Never be ashamed of that. And let today be your new start. No matter, it doesn't matter how far you far you fell. You belong to the most time. You have faith in Christ. You also have conviction. You belong to him. Walk as such. Walk as such. God bless each of you. I'm going to see you guys next time right here at COT. God bless.